is Michael Taylor from the Institute of Photonic Sciences, and he's going to tell us about the NMR Arduino. Okay. Uh, so first, hi, everyone, and thanks to the committee for the, the talk upgrade. I'm going to talk today about a small NMR spectrometer that we've developed in the course of our work on ultra-low field NMR. It works at sub-megahertz, so we're going even further down in frequency. It's credit card size, so I'm actually carrying one here in my conference name badge. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about it. So this was not something that we really set out deliberately to, to make, uh, we, but during the course of our work, we thought about this question, can NMR instrumentation be simple? And I think we've seen in this uh, instrumentation session of the conference that instrumentation is often far from simple, uh, and it's also not something that everybody has access to. Uh, so that's a traditional view. If you just look at the basic uh, uh, facts that you have different types of NMR instruments. So we have all different field ranges, uh, which we would need to choose depending on our sample, uh, all, all kind of other requirements. Uh, we might have a certain amount of money to spend. Uh, you can get away with DIYing if you have, if you're willing to invest the time. Uh, but it's certainly it's true that not, there's no one size fits all NMR. Uh, and of course, there's not just these, there's, um, if you often need more than one field in your experiment, you resort to something like field cycling. So the, the scope is even larger. And then if you say, well, um, uh, there, are, there are often uh, ways in which you can make simple circuits to do NMRs. So this is back in the old days. This is the Wolf 16 decoupler. And all of this circuit, it's shift registers and, and various things that are just designed to count one, two, three, and four uh, in some pattern. This is something that, although, in, although on paper it might look simple to construct, I think that very few of you are actually going to end up doing it yourself, uh, especially when you look at the picture of, of how this, uh, this was. So you're just uh, maybe wiring this up, but it's, it's not something that you're going to deliberately go out to do. So that contrasts a little bit with uh, what I see in the everyday world that uh, this is one of my favorite websites, Hackaday, and you can find all kinds of interesting robotics and uh, toys and devices that you can make for you and for your kids and for whatever else, like robots to solve Rubik's Cubes. And um, there's uh, something like 100,000 projects on, on Hackaday. So it must be somehow easy to develop these. Uh, these are mostly developed around the concept of something called an embedded system. So for those of you who are not so familiar with that, that's just a way of saying that you have a controller, some kind of electronic controller that uh, does the logic interface between sens sensors and actuators. So this clicker that I'm holding is an example of an embedded system because when I click the button, it's communicating via Bluetooth to the computer to, to change the slide and so on. So you could think of an NMR as an embedded system as well because we have sensors and we have outputs. We have the coils that supply current, that's the output. We want to digitize the signal and there's some kind of timing and, and memory. Um, so you could uh, imagine NMR to be an embedded system. And this was, of course, shown elsewhere in the instrumentation session uh, with these nice ASIC uh, single, single chip type uh, NMR spectrometers. But maybe that's still a little bit beyond everybody. Uh, so the reason why it's actually possible to um, develop these kind of uh, interesting devices is through a, a breakthrough um, in electronics prototyping, which is the Arduino ecosystem, and I'm sure many of you know about this. It was uh, introduced about 20 years ago now, and it, it dramatically um, yeah, simplified the design of embedded systems. It provided a huge simplification, because before, what you'd need to do is you'd need to get your integrated circuit microcontroller, you'd have to wire it up, you'd have to assign the pins to a particular task, and so on. Uh, and they did all of that for you by putting it on a single PCB that you just plug in to your computer over USB. And they also simplified the coding interface a lot, so they would take um, everything that you didn't really need to do up front and put it in the back end, so that if you wanted, for example, to blink the LED like is shown on here, this is the only code that you need to write. You just need to assign the pin, uh, and then you need to write this little loop here, which turned the, the light on, waited, turned the light off, uh, and waited again. And now that there's... Um, yeah, now it's been about 20 years since Arduino has been introduced. I recommend that you look with 15 years of hindsight in this uh, magazine article fr from Wired, which 
um, so he was pondering the, the open source nature of this program, whether it would actually be successful. And it seems like it's been incredibly successful because you, the whole world is full of Arduino now, as we've seen in the talks. Um, so coming back to NMR, then of course, there have been a few efforts to develop uh, microcontroller or Arduino-based NMR systems. This started with Carl Michael. Um, so he developed an, a nice a NMR and MRI system around 2010. He reviewed the state of the field a couple of years ago. And since then, there have been a few other uh, Arduino spectrometers which have uh, been developed, like uh, this one for controlling fields in a nitrogen vacancy center and diamond experiment. But OK, why have you never used any of these? Maybe it's still a little bit too complicated, because as you can see, there's a lot of wiring here. And is it really going to be something that you all set up uh, in your own lab? There's some limitations here. Uh, so although Arduino might be simple, then maybe these spectrometers are not so simple. Uh, and so we were guilty of this, actually, when we started using Arduino to detect NMR signals from an ultra-low field experiment. So uh, here, maybe, it's, there we go. Uh, this is the, the standard Arduino board, and it's connected up to an atomic magnetometer. I won't go into details on that. It's just a way of detecting magnet um, magnetization at... Uh, at very low fields and frequencies. Um, we are also using the Arduino to um, uh, move a sample in and out of this magnetic shield because it was pre-polarized outside, and we were also using it to apply pulse sequences. Uh, so, okay, we got some very nice uh, zero field and ultra low field spectra like you've seen in other talks. But again, this, is, this was um, something that was not super simple to set up. Uh, but soon the, we realized that there was potential to do a lot more. Uh, so when we started doing fast field cycling, uh, say in the, in the sub 10 kilohertz range, we we're doing these kind of experiments where we needed to switch a lot of fields, uh, pre-polarizing the sample around tens of millitesla uh, in some kind of water-cooled solenoid next to the magnetometer. And then we would have to switch these fields uh, on and off. And we've, we found that you could actually do this very effectively using uh, motor driver chips like these. Uh, so this is something that you might control a stepper motor with or some other kind of DC motor in a robot. Uh, this device is called an H-bridge because, it, as you can see from this geometry here, you can uh, close the, the switches of the H-bridge to make current go through one way uh, or another through the motor. So this is a way of achieving bidirectional um, current control. And you simply hook that switch up to a current amplifier. Again, this is uh, very simple circuitry stuff. Uh, and it was very cheap, so we thought there must be something to do here. And so that uh, led us to developing uh, a simplified spectrometer where we applied the principles of what Arduino was based on, which is taking everything that you didn't need and putting it in the back end. So we did that for the hardware. Here we took all the wiring, and we made that uh, all neat on a PCB. And then um, we use these, these um, motor driver modules, which you can simply buy yourself. And you don't, you don't need to do any soldering here, except you're soldering your um, 0.1 inch headers. So if you, if you can do that, then you can build this system. And this system here is very compact, so I'm carrying one here in the bag. And uh, we also simplified the, the software. Um, we had to write a lot of pulse programs for the fast field cycling uh, reluxometry, and we wanted an easy interface to do that. So we did that as a, a text file where you simply had a timestamp, and then uh, with each timestamp, you had something that was going on on one of the channels, and you only needed to specify the actual events were going on. So here we've got, uh, this is a pulse sequence which is represented graphically down below where you've got a uh, pre-polarizing pulse being applied, uh, and then you've got a DC, 90 degree pulse, so this basically means switching on a field where you have a quarter period of Lamo precession and then you turn it off again. That gives you 90 degrees. Uh, I'll show you that in action, this little video. Here we go. Uh, we're gonna, uh, we built this um, user interface where we could have um, just clicking a pulse sequence like the one that you saw on the previous si slide and loading it in. So this is a simple rectangular pulse. We click run. And here it is shown on the oscilloscope. We'll just load in a couple more and, and see what's possible. So this one that's coming up is going to be um, some kind of sine wave in, in case you wanted to do some RF type 
pulses. There you go. All, this is the entire experiment. So you just got the, uh, the NM Arduino board connected up to the laptop, uh, and then you have the output connected into the oscilloscope. That's all that's going on. And then you can generate some more interesting kind of profiles, and I'll explain those in a second. So you're probably wondering when is this kind of uh, device going to be available? Uh, we want to publish an article on it first, but then we will um, release all the source code and the breakout boards for, for what you just saw. Uh, and for those of you who don't like soldering or don't want to do it, uh, we probably will also end up uh, selling some units. If you want to get involved, uh, we are releasing some boards to, to labs for, for testing. So if you want to get involved in that, email us. And you can follow the, all of the progress here on, on Twitter. Probably there will be a separate website soon. So then, um, yeah, I want to come back to this original question about simple NMR. So can we do simple NMR now? Um, well, it's at least in sight that you could have a uh, very compact tabletop spectrometer that could be brought into the lecture theater or could be used in education. Based something like this, where you'd have a standard computer connected to the NM Arduino board. And in this case, we're uh, connecting it up to an atomic magnetometer, which again may be unfamiliar to, to many people, but this is now quite a, a highly developed device and it's not, uh, say, mainly being motivated for NMR. Uh, optically pumped magnetometers are being developed for brain magnetic field detection and many other areas. So the technology level of these is, is increasing and uh, they're coming down in price a lot. This, again, you could get a whole NMR spectrometer looking like this and would be completely transparent at all levels. And here are some examples of uh, more spectra, heteronuclear spectra like in trifluoroethanol, which is the standard these days when people do Earth's field NMR. Uh, and it's not shown in this talk, but we've gone up to, say, five or six kilohertz, uh, five to 10 kilohertz of uh, Lama frequency. Um, we've also used this for detecting NMR signals from hyperpolarization. This is your standard Sabre experiment. We bubble para-hydrogen through some kind of solvent. This is the classic pyridine system. And we did that in a six millitesla magnet and then clumsily stuffed it inside this 10, milli tesla, uh, sorry, 10 micro tesla solenoid where we do a pulse acquire measurement. And this is simply the comparison between the kind of signal that you can get with the, with the Sabre and with the, uh, with the standard thermal polarization, which is where you, again, polarize in this 6 milli tesla magnet and then, and then shuttle down. So again, th I think there's a lot of potential here with uh, with teaching that you could bring this into the lecture hall and show people Sabre going on in a, in a physical chemistry class. Um, oh yeah, so it's well known actually that you can polarize inside magnetic shield. So there's the possibility of uh, using techniques like Sabre sheath. So you could uh, not have to use this external magnet, you could do the entire experiment inside the magnetic shield. And that's something that's ongoing as well. We've also used this with dissolution DNP. So this is a spectrum of pyruvate. I'm not gonna go into that in the interest of time. Um, you might have a question about DC pulses. So when I said that we do a 90 degree pulse by applying a perpendicular field for a quarter Lamo period, uh, you would say, well, all of the spins will do, uh, do some kind of rotation, but the spin that you want will do a quarter Lamo period. So how do you control that? And we get around that issue with uh, composite pulses. So this is an example of a DC composite pulse that we made that will invert some spins, but not others. So in this case, it's inverting uh, the blue and the red spins and not inverting the black spin. Uh, so you could in invert hydrogen and not carbon, for example. Um, this is a more elaborate example of that, which was uh, based on stealing uh, the concept of, um, of uh, wideband inversion from Ray Freeman. So this is a burp pulse. Burp pulse in high field is normally a shape pulse, but we managed to uh, discretize it to make a DC composite pulse. And you can discretize uh, by, you, by you basically make a step in the flick, flip angle the cumulative flip angle throughout the burp pulse profile. And if you discretize at different uh, resolutions, then this can change your, your bandwidth. Um, so th the idea here is that the pulse itself introduces the resonance. You don't have to uh, rely on the 
the hardware to have the resonance because getting accurate timing is fairly easy. Uh, and I think it's interesting that here, so your, basically your pulse can be uh, about 10% off resonance and you can still have uh, high fidelity excitation. I think there's a lot of potential here. Um, and then we're also um, developing an, an inductive detection. So we're going interested in higher frequency. I think it's up to you what might be done with this system. So we'd like people to use it. Um, and so uh, with that, I would like to, to thank the, everybody who is involved in this, particularly uh, Sven, who is my student. He's done a lot of the coding and the user interface development. If you want to join our lab, then there's all of this uh, interesting spin dynamics that can be done. And, and with that, uh, thank you very much. Okay, we have time for some questions. Just uh, have a one quick question. Uh, so you said frequency range. So which nuclear? I mean, you show this for protons. So how far from this you can go? So what type of nuclear? You know, I'm organic chemist by training, so I'm not think about frequencies. I think about in terms of uh, which type of uh, uh, nuclear you can, um, you know, uh, use for this system, provided you have enough signal. Let's say if you with high polarization. Yeah, I would say that the signal is probably the, what the limiting factor. The, so hydrogen has the highest gyromagnetic ratio. It's going to have the highest signal. So we're not really limited in field. We're limited in sampling rate uh, or resi time resolution of the microcontroller. So actually hydrogen is one of the, the most challenging nuclei with respect to going to higher fields like megahertz. Uh, but you can imagine having uh, you know, carb carbon at... Uh, at, at some high frequency, yeah. So you think you, you can use it for carbon, right? I think you can use it for any nucleus. Yeah. Any nucleus. As long as you have the sensitivity. Yeah. Well, let's say you got this, this high polarization high signal, so you have, you know. So, sure. yeah, n I'm like nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon for sure. Yeah. Thank you. John. I was just curious, Kate, could you talk a little bit more about, like, your digitization, are you doing that directly on the Arduino, or how does that work? Uh, yeah, this is a separate ADC chip. Okay. Yeah. But as time goes on, you can imagine that if you find the right chip that does, or might offer a higher sampling rate, or is the most compatible with the microcontroller in terms of the communication protocol. And, and does it have the memory to that. store like a whole FID? Or, sorry, I didn't mean to talk. Oh. Um, yeah, so the micro microcontroller has a limited memory, yeah, but yeah. it's sufficient for sampling tens of seconds at, oh, okay. at say, um, I don't know, 10, 10 to 100 kilohertz speeds. Okay. Um, hi, uh, great talk. Um, I'm not an engineering person, but I assume the NMR Arduino covers the um, sort of the electronic part of things. But are there any like like readily available solutions for like pulsing and detecting? So I, I think you mentioned the atomic magnetometer. Is that also like commercially available? There are commercially available atomic magnetometers. There are a number of vendors. Most of them are North American, uh, but there are some European ones popping up as well. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank Michael again. Thanks.